And welcome, welcome. We have people streaming in from all around the country. You're here, hopefully, for Conquered Women Who Made a Difference. If that's what you uh, planned on listening to for the next hour, you're in the right place. Um, and so we'll get started in uh, about 30 seconds or so as people are streaming in. We had a very good, strong registration for this webinar um, and um, looking forward to uh, welcoming uh, everybody shortly. So as we get started, somebody already beat me to it. Hi, Lisa from Connecticut. Everybody else, if you don't mind putting into chat uh, where you're uh, calling in from today and maybe even why you're um, interested in this particular history, that would be fun to see as well. Um, so we are going to have a full hour here with our uh, historian, Victor Curran, and um, a little bit about AARP beforehand. So to kick us off, I want to share with you that um, this is being brought to you by AARP Massachusetts, uh, and we were on the virtual community center that AARP runs uh, for uh, members and the public all around the country, free events, free, free webinars like this. Uh, and I, I want to also say I'm very grateful to Beth Williams, uh, the tourist manager for the town of Concord, because she was very willing to collaborate when I reached out to her about starting a series on Concord history. Uh, our next webinar uh, is on April 30th at 1 p.m. Eastern, and that one's on Patriots of Color and uh, uh, Revolutionary New England. So if you're interested in that, look, go to arp.org slash VCC and you'll find it there listed on April 30th. Uh, and then we have a couple others afterwards that will soon be posted as well. Um, so if this is your first history webinar, you'll find that the Virtual Community Center has a lot of uh, events like this. And uh, if you're intrigued uh, and, and you wanna register for others, uh, we welcome that. And of course, uh, we're interested in luring you to visit Massachusetts if you're not already living in this wonderful state, and of course, visiting Concord. <clears throat> so about AARP, most of you know a, a good bit about us if you're an AARP member, and we maintain a really deep focus on uh, health, financial security, and personal fulfillment, which is probably why you're here today. Um, and um, we do this for people 50 and over and their families, uh, and that hopefully you'll see that reflected in our offerings and our resources and in our advocacy work. Uh, so speaking of advocacy, right now uh, in every state and all the way to the United States Capitol, uh, we are advocating for issues that affect you most. Uh, and we're fighting to protect your hard earned uh, Medicare and social security benefits. Uh, we're urging Congress to lower prescription drug prices uh, support family caregivers, and stop scams and shut down fraud. Uh, we're making a big difference, we think. Uh, we're taking on big pharma, and we're winning. Uh, Medicare is now able to negotiate for lower prices on some prescription drugs, and insulin copays are capped at uh, $35 a month. Uh, we're also fighting any proposed cuts to Social Security. Uh, you've worked hard to save for retirement, whether you're retired or soon to be retired, and it's your money, and uh, you deserve to keep every cent of it. Um, so we'll keep fighting to protect your interests here in Massachusetts and across the country. You will want to bookmark our state page, uh, which is aarp.org MA, where we post about all of our events, our wins, and our calls to action. And wherever you are, uh, you can find your local state office by going to aarp.org slash local. Uh, our, one of our goals is to keep you very well informed. So as you think of questions today that you wanna ask our speaker, you can place them in the Q&A section and we will get to as many of them as possible in the uh, remaining time. Uh, after today, the recording will be sent to you. Um, there will also be a brief survey that we really hope you will answer, uh, give us your feedback so we can continue to improve the richness of our offerings. All right, so Victor, today's presenter is Victor Curran. Uh, Victor, hi Victor. Victor leads tours of historic Concord and is an interpreter at the Concord Museum and the Old Manse. Uh, he teaches courses and writes articles about the men and women who made Concord the home of American independence and imagination. 
Uh, we'll get to know Victor a little bit too at the end. Uh, if we have time for questions, uh, I think that it's exciting to um, to learn um, about any history that um, passed us by in, in, in our years in school or our, our years afterwards. And Victor has done, as you can see from his bookshelf, a lot of reading about this. Uh, so thank you for making time to be with us today. And now let's enjoy and maybe get out your notebooks, um, all that Victor has to share with us today. Thank, thank you. Um, Concord, Massachusetts gets over a million visitors a year. And that's not bad for a little country town. And the reason people come here uh, is that a lot of things happened here. And the one that most people have heard about is the one that happened 249 years ago next month, uh, which is the shot heard around the world. <clears throat> and everybody, at least all Americans, have, have, uh, have heard that story. Uh, Paul Revere and the other alarm riders of uh, the Minuteman making their stand at the Rude Bridge across the Concord River. Uh, but there's another story. And that's the one that uh, you don't usually find in your textbooks. Uh, because when the Redcoats marched into Concord, only about 100 of them were at the North Bridge. There were 600 other Redcoats in Concord. And what were they doing here? They were looking all over town because their spies had told them we were hiding weapons and ammunition here. Uh, but they didn't find a lot of the weapons and ammunition. And the reason for that are the people you don't always hear about in the history books, and those are the women of Concord. So, um, this is the home of Colonel James Barrett, commander of the Minutemen. <clears throat> now, on the morning of April 19th, 1775, he wasn't home, he was down the road at the North Bridge with the rest of the Minutemen, but his wife, Rebecca Hubbard Barrett, was home. Uh, and uh, over 100 Redcoats came to their house because they had found out from their spies that weapons were hidden there, including four bronze cannons, and they were looking for those things. Uh, they marched up to the house. They said, our orders are to search your house from top to bottom, but they didn't find them. Uh, Rebecca Barrett and her sons had hidden everything too well and uh, though left left the Redcoats kind of frustrated because they had just marched 20 miles in the dark to get here and uh, so they were tired and they were annoyed and they demanded food and drink and Rebecca Barrett gave it to them uh, and she said oh we are commanded to feed our enemies they threw a handful of coins at her and she just threw them on the floor and said, this is the price of blood. <clears throat> now, over on the other side of town uh, was a tavern owned by Ephraim Jones. And that was another place where weapons were hidden. Redcoats forced their way in there. Um, now, one of the people who worked at the tavern was a woman named Hannah Barnes. And Hannah Barnes uh, knew that Henry Gardner, the treasurer of the Provincial Congress, was staying at the tavern, and in his room he had a chest full of money and secret papers. Uh, so when the Redcoats wanted to go in that room, Hannah said, you can't go in there, that's my room. And so gentlemen that they were, they didn't go in, and they didn't get the money, and they didn't get the secret papers. A little farther down the road, it's, this is a picture actually drawn in, 19, in 1775, um, a little further down the road where you can't see in this picture was the home of uh, Patriot Amos Wood and his wife Dorothy. And uh, when the British soldiers got there, uh, they pointed to the door where the hidden weapons were. And the officer said, are there some females in there? And Dorothy Wood uh, said, I forbid anyone entering this room. So she also kept the Redcoats from, from finding hidden uh, military supplies. Now, possibly the, the greatest unsung hero of April 19, 1775 in Concord um, was Martha Moulton. Uh, she was described as an aged widow, and she worked as a housekeeper for Dr. Timothy Minot, who is, you see his house on the corner there. Uh, and 
when the redcoats marched into town, you see all the redcoats marching down the road there. When they marched into town, any military supplies that they found, if they if it was something that would burn, something made of wood, like gun carriages or shovels, uh, or even the town's liberty pole, they made a pile of them right over there by the courthouse, which you see on the right, and set them on fire. And Martha, from Dr. Minot's house, she saw this fire, and she came running out in the street and it told the soldiers, put out the fire. And the soldiers are like, oh, mother, we won't do you any harm. Uh, but she got their attention. She said, the top of the courthouse is filled with gunpowder. If you don't put out the fire, uh, it's going to catch fire. We're all going to be blown up. Now, I don't know if that story was true, but it worked. She got them to put out the fire and she saved the town. <clears throat> now, that same day, another conquered woman was watching the battle at the North Bridge. Here's Here are the Minutemen at the North Bridge. Now, I want you to look up on the horizon there. You see the little house up there on the horizon with two chimneys? <clears throat> that uh, was the home of the town's minister, Reverend William Emerson. It looks like this. <clears throat> and his wife, P.B. Emerson, was watching the battle from the windows of that house in her arms holding her eight-month-old daughter, Mary Moody Emerson. Uh, now, the following year, Reverend Emerson joined the Army as a chaplain. Sadly, he never came home. He got dysentery while he was in the Army and died, uh, leaving uh, Phoebe as a widow with five children. And that was more than she could handle. So she uh, asked some relatives in the town of Malden, Massachusetts, to take care of little two-year-old Mary. Uh, so Mary was sent away from home to... Uh, live with relatives, and she described this later as her infant exile. Relatives she was staying with were not wealthy. They they uh, lived in the shadow of poverty, and they put Mary to work as what one historian calls a domestic drudge. Uh, and one of her chores was to warn her caregivers uh, if she saw the deputy sheriff coming to confiscate the spoons or to arrest the uncle for debt. Uh, so she grew up uh, with a hard childhood and it made her very self-reliant. Her nephew, Ralph Waldo Emerson, the writer, uh, would later describe, say that the destitution is the muse of her genius. But she did learn to read and that changed her life. Um, as a teenager, uh, she was called back to Concord uh, but by this time, her mother had remarried and now had three more children to raise. So they just put Mary to work again, doing duties which tried me, as she put it. Uh, but she found an escape in a new library that had been founded in Concord. Uh, founded, uh, one of the co-founders was her stepfather, Ezra Ripley. <clears throat> as her biographer, Phyllis Cole, writes, she in the her books in the library she discovered a religion of rational proof and understanding the physical universe as a revelation of God. She was coming around to a, a radical point of view that reading books was more important than hearing sermons. Um, rather than worshiping in church, she said, "I dance to the music of my own imagination." Now, in 1797, her grandmother died, left her a little bit of money, just enough to buy a little house in the town of Malden. So she was uh, had a freedom that was not available to most women in her time. She was able to live on her own, and she really appreciated that. <clears throat> her older brother, William, by this time, had become the minister of a church in Boston, and he was also publishing this literary magazine called the Monthly Anthology. And Mary Moody Emerson wrote articles for the uh, Monthly Anthology. She wrote under the pen name of Constance, uh, and recurring themes in her articles were nature and imagination. Uh, and uh, those are ideas that Years later, you're going to see uh, dominating the work of her nephew, Ralph Waldo Emerson. <clears throat> now, when William, who published the magazine, uh, died, he died young, uh, and Mary stepped in to help his widow raise her children, including young Ralph Waldo Emerson. Uh, and uh, one acquaintance wrote, 
Emerson derived much of his character from his aunt. He copied whole uh, uh, letters from her and excerpts from her journal for his own reading and inspiration. So <clears throat> Emerson then went on to, uh, to go to seminary, study for the ministry as his father and grandfather had done. Um, and Mary offered him this radical idea that you could have a spiritual life without the church. She said, in entire solitude, minds find revelation, altar, and priest in the uniform and constant miracle of nature. Uh, later, uh, Emerson would leave the ministry. There is there is Emerson. <laughs> and he, uh, he settled in Concord. And that is where he wrote Nature. Nature is the essay that has launched his literary career, and it inspired the Transcendentalist movement. And Mary's biographer, Phyllis Cole, writes that Waldo incorporated more of what he learned from Mary in the essay Nature than in any other single, single published work of his career. Uh, if you hear me keep calling him Waldo, it's because, like a lot of the people uh, in that time, he didn't go by his first name. He went by his middle name. His name Ralph Waldo Emerson. People called him Waldo. Nobody called him Ralph. Uh, <clears throat> I'm actually kind of disappointed about that uh, because I like to imagine like Henry David Thoreau going over to his house and knocking on the door and going, hey, Ralphie boy. But that never happened. Uh, in the 1830s, uh, Mary's religious fervor found a new outlet uh, in the campaign to abolish slavery in America. Uh, she went to speeches by leading abolitionists. She actually invited abolitionist leaders uh, to breakfast at Waldo's house. <clears throat> she was trying to recruit him to become a spokesman for the movement because by the 1840s, he was a celebrity. He was famous as a writer famous as uh, an orator. Um, and finally, he came around in 1844. Uh, there was a uh, anti-slavery rally in Concord on the 10th anniversary of the abolition of slavery in the West Indies, and Emerson did address that rally. <clears throat> now, through Emerson, Mary Moody Emerson met Henry David Thoreau. That's him on the right there. Uh, and uh, they shared a uh, commitment to the anti-slavery politics. They they uh, were both very interested in nature. They both prized solitude uh, and both made experiments in independent living. Uh, Henry wrote this about Mary Moody Emerson. He said, she's the wittiest and most vivacious woman that I know. Uh, certainly that woman among my acquaintances who it is the most profitable to meet. She's the least frivolous who will most surely provoke to good conversation and the expression of what is in you. In short, she is a genius. She was also kind of eccentric. Uh, in 1844, uh, this is twenty, almost 20 years before she died, in 1844, um, she had a nightgown made in the style of a burial shroud. Uh, and her nephew wrote that she wore her burial shroud nightgown. She wore it as a nightgown. She wore it as a day gown. She wore it until it wore, wore out, and then she had another one made. Uh, she went horseback riding in her shroud, and she made her bed in the shape of a coffin. So she had a fascination with death. She was ready for death long before death was ready for her. Uh, she did die at the age of 88 in 1863. So think about the bookends of her life. Here is somebody who, as a baby, witnessed the beginning of American freedom with the shot heard around the world at the North Bridge. And she lived long enough to see that freedom extended to Black Americans with the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. Now, Ralph Waldo Emerson spoke at Mary's funeral and he gave a eulogy. And in her his eulogy, he said this. She delighted in success, in youth, in beauty, in genius, in manners. When she met a young person who interested her, she made herself acquainted and intimate with him or her at once. 
by sympathy, by flattery, by raillery, by anecdotes, by wit, by rebuke, and stormed the castle. And now, one of the young people that uh, Mary mentored was Sarah Alden Bradford. Like Mary, she longed for the education that at at that time, she was born in 1793, <clears throat> at that time, that, that this kind of education was only a privilege uh, afforded to men, and she longed for that education. And she became an educator herself. Uh, she and Mary both examined the natural world, uh, hoping to learn its secrets, and through a sequence of remarkable connections, Sarah ended up owning the house that Mary Moody Emerson was born in. Unlike Mary, she did get married and, and have a family, and through some superhuman effort, she did all of that while continuing her intellectual pursuits. Uh, when she was just a schoolgirl, uh, Sarah said to her father, she says, I want to study Latin. And her father uh, said, certainly, study anything you like. And she, she later wrote to a friend, uh, we are blessed with parents who are desirous of our improvement in useful knowledge. <clears throat> Sarah's formal education ended in 1808 because her mother became ill with tuberculosis. And so at age 15, she was thrust into the adult role of caring for her younger siblings. Uh, she found us in her studies a way to maintain her sense of self amid family pressures. <clears throat> Two years later, uh, the family moved from Boston to comparatively rural Duxbury, Massachusetts. And in the country, she discovered a new focus for her intellectual curiosity, and that was botany. She said, it's not a very useful study, although a very pleasing one. It enables us to discover divine wisdom, even in the construction of the smallest flower. When she was almost 18, she joined Mary Moody Emerson in helping to uh, care for and educate the children who, of uh, Ruth Emerson, in other words, Ralph Waldo Emerson and his siblings. So this is when Mary Moody Emerson kind of drew Sarah Bradford into her magic circle, as she called it. Uh, So their paths seem to converge around the study of plants. Uh, Sarah wrote that scientific discoveries vindicate the ways of God to man. And Mary approved of Sarah's theological approach to botany. Uh, so both of them were laying down the foundation of transcendentalism uh, at the very time when Ralph Waldo Emerson was under their tutelage. Uh, now, Mary Moody Emerson never married, never have any, had any interest in getting married, but she didn't mind playing matchmaker. She played, uh, she encouraged a, uh, a romance uh, be uh, between uh, her, between her friend Sarah Bradford and her half-brother Samuel Ripley. Samuel Ripley was the minister in the town of Waltham. A lot of ministers in this story. Uh, and he and Sarah got married in 1818. Now, Samuel, uh, in, where he had his church in Waltham, he also ran a school. And so when he and Sarah got married, Sarah took over running the school. Uh, and uh, she had some Harvard undergraduates as assistants in running that school. And one of them was, guess who? Ralph Waldo Emerson. Um uh, and here's what he had to say about her. She said, he said, talk on whatever you will, and she can always give you a new idea. She is the finest woman I ever saw. Sarah's reputation as an educator spread even to the hallowed halls of Concord. I'm sorry, the hallowed halls of Harvard. Concord has some hallowed halls too, but it was the hallowed halls of Harvard. Uh, now in those days, if you were, um, if you were a Harvard student and you broke the rules or you fell behind academically, you got rusticated. Rusticated meant that they would send you off campus 
to live with a nearby minister. And hopefully the minister would uh, get you to step back in line. Uh, and so Harvard students were rusticated to the um, uh, to the uh, Samuel Ripley's church in Waltham. And Sarah tutored them. And they would go back to the Harvard camp campus and say they, they had learned more from Sarah Ripley than they learned from their Harvard professors. Um, Harvard President Edward Everett said she could have taught any course at the college if that had when had been allowed to do that in those days. She also befriended a, a botany professor at Harvard, Asa Gray, uh, and he regarded her as a peer. Uh, he visited her. She visited his laboratory and uh, they borrowed books from each other. Uh, Sarah's reputation uh, drew her into the orbit of some of the era's most notable women, including Margaret Fuller. I know there is at least one Margaret Fuller fan in the audience I saw in the chat. We're going to talk about her in a minute. But right now, uh, I want to talk about uh, somebody who was um, Sarah Ripley's tenant. Um, Sarah uh, Ripley's father-in-law, uh, Ezra Ripley, died in 1841 at the age of 90, and Samuel and Sarah inherited this house, the old man's in Concord. Uh, they didn't move in right away. Uh, in 1842, they rented it to a couple of penniless newlyweds named Sophia Peabody and Nathaniel Hawthorne. And we'll hear more about them in a minute. <coughs> so uh, they were there for three years. Uh, in 1845, Sarah and her husband uh, moved with their children into the old manse. Uh, and uh, the Hawthorns were behind in the rent, so they evicted them. Uh, and now uh, in Concord, Sarah found relief from the hectic pace of a preacher's wife. Uh, and she also uh, continued her botanical studies, did private tutoring, presided over a gaggle of grandchildren. Uh, and for a time, her household even included the aging Mary Moody Emerson, who lived uh, at the old manse for a while around 1850. And well into old age in her 70s, uh, Sarah was still reading Don Quixote in Spanish, and she was reading uh, Les, Les Miserables in French, uh, but her health was waning, and her remarkable life came to an end uh, in 1867, uh, shortly before her 74th birthday. Uh, Reverend Henry Hedge spoke at her burial service at the Old Manse, and he said some of her friends had expressed a regret that she left behind no published work. But in the hearts of those who knew her, she wrote a book whose substance they will remember as long as they remember anything. So I want to back up now <clears throat> and talk about another extraordinary woman who was Sarah Ripley's tenant. And that's Sophia Peabody. Uh, who would be going to marry Nathaniel Hawthorne. Uh, Sophia Peabody was born in Salem, uh, 1809, and her mother was a teacher. She believed in the education of women. Uh, she ran a school in their home and taught the same curriculum for girls and boys, which at the time was quite uh, advanced. Um, she taught history, classics, and writing. Uh, one biographer wrote that in the Peabody household, women held the intellectual, emotional, and financial authority, and Sophia flourished. <clears throat> now, Sophia showed an early talent for art. This is one of her paintings. Uh, she studied with some of the leading American painters of her time. Uh, she wrote, uh, the violent commotions of my heart were quieted by my teacher pronouncing my work very well done, better than ex expected. What an intense feeling of delight it gives me to think that I may ever create too. One teacher encouraged her to paint from nature as opposed to copying other paintings, which was common for art students at the time. Oh, in 1834, the Boston Athenaeum exhibited one of her paintings. Uh, she was teaching art students of her own. Uh, she sold paintings 
in the 1830s for as much as $60, which today would be around $2,000. Uh, in 1833, a very interesting thing happened. Sophia's sister Mary got hired to be a governess for the children of a wealthy doctor in Cuba. And Sophia went along with Mary and lived in Cuba for a year and a half. Now, during that time, she wrote letters home. She wrote something along the lines of 900 pages of letters home. And her family saved those letters. And they referred to them as her Cuba journal. Here is a page from her Cuba journal. <laughs> now, I'm going to read you a, a little bit from a biography uh, of Sophia, written by Megan Marshall, who teaches it at uh, Emerson College. Uh, she writes, her artistic eye was dazzled by everything she saw. The green of the trees is greener than ever any green I ever saw before. Uh, she described the sunrise as a gorgeous display of saffron and purple and the sunset as a deep lapis lazuli softened off through every degree and shade of purple, blue, and rose till it faded into the invisible. Uh, Sophia worked to perfect the style of nature writing that she had begun to develop in Massachusetts. And uh, if her Cuba journal had been published when it was written, which is 10 years before Emerson wrote nature, uh, Sophia would have been counted among the earliest practitioners of literary transcendentalism. She wrote, how beautifully nature educates the soul uh, this was a formulation that anticipated Emerson and Thoreau. Uh, nature was teaching her that intuition is the unerring truth. Uh, even before there was a name for it, Sophia was an instinctive transcendentalist. <clears throat> and when she returned to Massachusetts, she resumed painting um, and giving art lessons. Uh, she read Emerson, and she recognized someone who shared her conviction that visible beauty points to a deeper reality. Now, um, Sophia's other sister, Elizabeth, had written some ad admiring reviews of stories by a fellow named Nathaniel Hawthorne. And she invited Nathaniel to come visit them at their house. And on his second visit, he met Sophia. He rose and looked at her intently with a piercing, indrawing gaze. Uh, and Elizabeth also kind of uh, piqued Nathaniel's interest by showing him uh, Sophia's Cuba journal. <laughs> and the Cuba journal jump-started Nathaniel's writing career that was kind of stalled at that point. Um, in 1830, by 1839, she and, and Nathaniel were an item. Um, she drew illustrations for his story that he wrote, The Gentle Boy. That's what you see on the left. Uh, and she also took up sculpture. On the right, you see uh, a bust of Laura Bridgman that she made. Laura Bridgman was a student at the Perkins School for the Blind. That's why you see her eyes covered. Um, Sophia and Nathaniel got married in 1842, and that day they moved into Concord's old manse. Uh, Sophia found that Concord was ideologically her native land, the fertile ground to cultivate indigenously American thought and the literature to express it. Uh, they kept a, she and Nathaniel kept a shared journal uh, reflecting on their new home and the natural world around it, and Sophia's entries are especially vivid using sexual metaphors to describe nature. And they called it their honeymoon journal. Uh, when their daughter, Una, was born in 1844, they, they decided they had to, to tone it down a little bit, so they started calling it their family journal. Uh, now, in the early years of their marriage, Sophia was expanding Nathaniel's literary horizons, but he was constricting hers. Um, so she channeled her energy into their family and into educating their children. Uh, she employed what they call a less mechanical, more visual, tactile, and kinesthetic style of teaching. Uh, and she wove transcendentalism into her homeschooling lessons. Uh, she taught fairy tales. She taught 
classical mythology. Now, around this time, Nathaniel is starting to write The Scarlet Letter, his most famous book. <clears throat> and Sophia served as the inspiration for his protagonist, uh, Hester Prynne, uh, who was a self-ordained sister of mercy, a wiser and better mother. And when he read his manuscript to Sophia, she cried. She said, she really thought an ocean was trying to pour out of my heart and eyes. And the Scarlet Letter changed their lives, made a lot of money. So they bought uh, a house in Concord that they called uh, the uh, the Wayside. Uh, but they didn't stay there for too long because uh, uh, Nathaniel's college buddy, Franklin Pierce, got elected president of the United States. And in 1853, he appointed Nathaniel to be the United States consul to Liverpool. So the family moved to England. Uh, and then at the end of the Pierce administration, which was one term, uh, they moved to Rome before coming back to the United States. Uh, and in Rome, Sophia uh, began doing artwork again, and she encountered a whole community of expatriate American women artists who were living and working in Rome and welcomed her into their, into their community. They did come back to the U.S. in 1860, and it was very different from the place that they left. Um, the, the United States was on the brink of civil war, and Nathaniel's physical as well as mental health were starting to suffer at this point. Sophia thought that maybe travel would help him uh, recover physically and mentally, and so in 1864, she encouraged him to take a trip up to New Hampshire, uh, visit, traveling along with his old college buddy, Franklin Pierce, former president. Uh, but Nathaniel's health just got worse, and he died in New Hampshire on the trip. Uh, and when he died, he left a bunch of unfinished manuscripts, and his financial situation was a mess. So Sophia was busy trying to sort that out, trying to edit his manuscripts for publication, uh, but by 1870, she could no longer afford to keep up the house in Concord, and she sold the house, and in 1870, she moved to England. Uh, but her health took a turn for the worse, and she died a year later uh, of respiratory illness and was buried in London. A few years after that, her daughter, Una, died also in London and was buried there. And then 18 years ago, in 2006, the family arranged to have Sophia's and Una's remains brought home to Concord from London and buried alongside Nathaniel uh, at uh, Sleep Concord's Sleepy Hollow Cemetery. And when they had that ceremony, they used a horse-drawn hearse that you see here believed to be the same one that was used for Nathaniel's funeral 142 years earlier. So the next person I would like to tell you about is really the person who got me interested in all uh, these extraordinary women uh, in, in Concord, and that's Margaret Fuller, and I did see in the comments there's at least one Margaret Fuller fan in the in our audience today. Uh, Margaret Fuller, uh, she was an educator, author, editor, critic, a journalist, a feminist, uh, an advocate for prison reform and for Native American rights. Uh, and in a world where men claim to have all the answers, she made it her mission to ask the right questions. As a young adult, she wrote, how came I here? How is it that I seem to be this Margaret Fuller? What does it mean? What shall I do about it? She was born Sarah Margaret Fuller. She's another one who used her middle name. Uh, in 1810 in Cambridge, Massachusetts, she was the oldest child of Timothy Fuller, who was a school teacher turned lawyer, turned politician, turned farmer. <laughs> and he wanted his daughter to have the same education a boy would have gotten. She educated him the same way he would have educated his son. Um, she had a knack for things that in her time were considered male things. 
uh, rough and tumble outdoor play, rigorous academic study. If she had been a boy, she could have gone to Harvard. Uh, but since that wasn't available to her, she was stuck at home teaching school to her younger siblings, kind of like uh, Sarah Ripley, uh, but making time for her own independent study and seeking out uh, adult mentors uh, such as the abolitionist author uh, Lydia Maria Child. Now, Cambridge with Harvard there was full of young intellectuals, and she made it her business to get to know them. She taught herself German in three months and was translating Goethe. Oh, by age 25, she was publishing her own essays and reviews. But <clears throat> that same year, her father died, and he didn't leave much money for his family. So she uh, decided to earn a living by teaching. Uh, she taught her students about women authors. Uh, she offered them role models from the goddesses of ancient mythology to the recently crowned Queen Victoria. Uh, she, uh, in, in Cambridge, she uh, made friends with Henry Hedge, who introduced her to Ralph Waldo Emerson. And, and she began attending meetings of the Transcendental Club at, at Waldo's home in Concord, along with Sarah Ripley. Uh, in 1839, she sought out women, she said, desirous to answer the great questions, what were we born to do? How shall we do it? Um, she called her meetings conversations. They were like, they were like college seminars, but since women weren't allowed to go to college, this was, she was offering college seminars uh, to women. Uh, 25 women bought $10 tickets for a 13 week series of conversations. When she started out, she was discussing classical mythology, but by the end of the first season, uh, they were analyzing the role of women in society. In 1840, the Transcendental Club, members in the gang, decided to publish their own journal. They called it The Dial. And Emerson recruited Margaret Fuller to be its first editor, as well as a regular contributor. Now, Margaret Fuller was never a permanent resident of Concord, but she was here a lot, and she made a big impression while she was. She would stay with the Emersons, or she sometimes stayed with the Hawthorns at the Old Manse. Uh, and she also got to know Henry David Thoreau, uh, who, whose writing she had whipped into shape at the dial. Uh, her friendship with Emerson was very, very close. Um, so close uh, that her magnetic personality unsettled him and caused not a little distress to his wife, Lydian. Uh, but they had different styles. Uh, he was more aloof and she was more emotional, and that drove them apart. She wrote to him, wise man, you never knew what it is to love. Apparently, he didn't know what it was to pay your editor either. So she quit as the uh, editor of The Dial. Uh, in 1843, she decided to write a travel book, and she traveled to Lakes Erie, Huron, and Michigan. This was the frontier in those days. Uh, and she wrote the book called Summer in the Lakes, and Summer in the Lakes uh, sold well. Um, and uh, the New York Tribune wrote, this is an illustration from that book, uh, the New York Tribune wrote that Fuller was one of the most original as well as intellectual of all American women. And the publisher of the Tribune is somebody you might have heard of, Horace Greeley, uh, proposed expanding one of Margaret's essays into a book. And in 1845, uh, that was published as Woman in the 19th Century. Uh, that's now considered the founding document of American feminism. And in Woman in the 19th Century, she wrote, we would have every path laid open to woman as freely as to man. If you ask me what offices they may fill, I reply, any. Let them be sea captains, if you will. Now, in 1846, uh, really sent her to Europe as a foreign correspondent. She's the first American woman to hold that role. Uh, and she was in Rome when the revolution to unify Italy began. And she found herself a war correspondent for the Tribune. In Italy, she met a young Italian named Giovanni Ossoli. 
uh, and that encounter changed her life forever. She wrote, I have not been so well since I was a child, nor so happy ever. They became lovers. They had a son, Angelo. Uh, they may have gotten married, though no record of their marriage survives. Uh, in 1850, after the Roman Republic fell, uh, Margaret, Giovanni, and their son uh, got on a ship to sail to America. But they never made it. Uh, their ship was wrecked uh, within sight of land off of Fire Island, New York, and they were all lost, along with all that she had written in Italy. And Waldo Emerson was heartbroken. He wrote, I have lost my audience. He sent Henry David Thoreau to Fire Island to hopefully recover, at least recover their bodies or their personal effects or some of her manuscripts. But all he managed to find was a button from Ossalie's coat. Margaret Fuller was only 40 when she died. <clears throat> but in that short life, she had become one of the most important public intellectuals, male or female, uh, of her time. Now, the next person that I want to tell you about, a uh, conquered woman, is Susan Robbins Garrison. Um, unfortunately, she died right around the time photography was invented, so I don't have a picture of her, but that's her house. Uh, she was uh, born around 1780. She was the daughter of Caesar Robbins and Kate Boaz Robbins. Both of her parents had been enslaved. Uh, her father had taken his freedom while serving in the army during the American Revolution. Uh, after the war, he lived in Concord and worked as a tenant farmer. Uh, and shortly after he died in 1822, his son Peter bought a house, <clears throat> and uh, that house called the Robbins House is what you see in the picture. <laughs> it's, it's preserved now less than a mile from its original site, uh, and it is open to the public uh, to teach the history of Black Americans in Concord. Uh, they also have a terrific website. Um, in 1812, Caesar's daughter Susan married Jack Garrison, who had come to live in Concord as a free man after escaping from slavery in New Jersey. Uh, and he and Susan had three children that su survived to adulthood, uh, John, William, and Ellen. Uh, in 1823, Susan and Jack and their children moved into this house that you see here. Uh, so they lived in the half on the right, and Peter and his wife Fatima lived in the half on the left. Just for the record, it's a 544-square-foot house. So she may have only been one generation away from slavery, uh, raising a family in less than 300 square feet, uh, but she held her head high in the town of Concord. She enrolled her children in the uh, town schools where they were remembered as bright and intelligent and well-trained at home, all good scholars. Uh, in 1837, 61 Concord women formed the Concord Free Male Anti-Slavery Society, and Susan Garrison um, was a founding member and held the second meeting of the society at her home. Uh, and her growing political activism is evident uh, from the petitions that she signed to end slavery in Washington, D.C., to end the slave trade, to oppose the annexation of Texas, and to support the right of the Cherokee people to live on their ancestral lands. Uh, by the time she died in 1841, uh, her children were well established as members of the Concord community. Her daughter Ellen, I'm going to talk about in a minute, um, her son John was elected as a survey of highways. The first parish in Concord entrusted him as the tithing man. He, it was his job to collect the money, so he must have been a pretty trustworthy guy. Uh, and then her, her younger son, William, uh, worked as a farmhand. Um, together, oh, I forgot to show you the picture there. Well, this is this is Elon Copley, who is uh, in period dress as Ellen Garrison, the daughter of Susan and Jack, who became a champion uh, of the rights of people of color, both in Concord and elsewhere. Born in 1823, that's around the time her parents moved into the Robbins house. Uh, her father was formerly enslaved. Her grandfather was formerly enslaved. The struggle for justice was 
flowing in her veins. Uh, in 1835, the town of Concord gave, so she's 12 at that time, or uh, 11 or 12, uh, the town of Concord gave a parade to celebrate the 200th anniversary of the founding of the town. And in that parade, the school children marched two by two. And a nine-year-old white neighbor named Abba Prescott took 12-year-old Ellen's hand and together they marched proudly through the center of town as their neighbors looked on with what was described as curiosity, surprise, ridicule, and admiration. And their bold act was reported uh, in The Slave's Friend, which was a national abolitionist magazine. Uh, so inspired by her mother's activism, Ellen signed a petition supporting the rights of the Cherokee people when she was 18, she moved to Boston, uh, and uh, Mary Merrick Brooks, who was another Concord abolitionist, wrote her a letter of reference to the to the Boston uh, Female Anti-Slavery Society. She described Ellen as a very intelligent girl, having borne away the prize most frequently in our schools for superiority of learning. Uh, Ellen joined the Anti-Slavery Society during the Civil War. She worked as a teacher, and around 1865, uh, she joined the American Missionary Association and went to Port Deposit, Maryland, um, to teach in a school run by the Freedmen's Bureau. The Freedmen's Bureau uh, was an agency set up after the Civil War uh, to educate formerly enslaved people uh, for their lives. As, as free citizens. And on her application, Ellen wrote, I have a great desire to go and labor among the freedmen of the South. I think it is our duty as a people to spend our lives trying to elevate our own race. Who can feel for us if we do not feel for ourselves? In, in Maryland, uh, Ellen and another black teacher tested the brand new Civil Rights Act of 1866 when a Station master forcibly ejected her and another black teacher from the waiting room of, of a Baltimore railroad station. In uh, uh, a book in 1984, the author Dorothy Sterling tells us what happened next. She said, uh, backed by the Freedmen's Bureau and the black people of Baltimore, Ellen brought the railroad and the conductor to court. This action took a great deal of moral courage. She wrote, our soldiers went with sword and bayonet to contend for right and justice. We could not do that, but we contend against outrage wherever we find it. Uh, in the late 1870s, Ellen moved to Kansas, where uh, many African-Americans from the South uh, had relocated under the uh, Homestead Act of 1862. Uh, one, uh, she married, she was a teacher there, and she married a homesteader named Harvey Clark. And the surprising end of the story is that in 1880, they moved to Pasadena, California. And that is where her remarkable life came to an end. Uh, the town of Concord is right now building a new middle school. And here in Concord, where there is a, a strong grassroots movement to name the middle school, uh, the Ellen Garrison Middle School, honoring her work as a teacher. So last but not least is the one Concord woman everybody has heard of, and that's Louisa May Alcott. Uh, uh, she grew up in a family uh, that was chronically short of cash, but when she finally wrote Little Women and hit the jackpot, she was very generous. Uh, she indulged in very few luxuries for herself, and uh, mostly that was after she had paid off her parents' debts and her sister's education. Um, she was born in uh, Germantown, Pennsylvania in 1832. Uh, her mother, Abba Alcott, uh, came from a prominent New England family that gave her a good education. Uh, and her father was Bronson Alcott, who was a Connecticut farm boy who uh, turned into a self-educated schoolmaster who had big ideas, but no money. And in 1834, they moved to Boston where he founded a, an experimental school and Louisa's childhood in Boston really shaped her character, particularly her commitment to the abolition of slavery. Uh, playing on the Boston Common one day, she fell into the frog pond and thought she was going to drown. But a black boy pulled her to safety. In 1835, uh, William Lloyd Garrison, the publisher of the anti-slavery newspaper, The Liberator, uh, 
tried to present a speech by a famous abolitionist named George Thompson, but there was a riot uh, and Garrison was actually uh, taken to the jail for his own safety. Uh, and those keeping him company included Louisa's parents. And Louisa wrote, I became an abolitionist at a very early age. The family moved to Concord in 1840 when Louisa was eight. Um, and it was a refreshing change. Uh, she said, her wise mother, anxious to give me a strong body to support my lively brain, turned me loose in the country and let me run wild, uh, learning of nature what no books can teach. Because if you don't teach your kids about transcendentalism, who will? Uh, <clears throat> by the time she was a teenager, of course, she was not uh, able to go to college, um, but uh, she educated herself. She she borrowed books from Ralph Waldo Emerson's library, and she educated herself. Uh, when she was old enough, she helped to supplement her family's income by teaching and by working as a housekeeper. And she was resigned to the reality that sewing and teaching paid better than writing. But she managed to publish her first book in 1854, when she was only 22. It's called Flower Fables. And these were stories that originated as stories she made up when she was babysitting the Emerson children. In 1857, her parents moved into the Orchard House, which is still preserved as a house that you can visit. Uh, her younger sister, Lizzie's health was uh, declining. She had scarlet fever. Uh, she died in 1858 with Louisa and her mother by her side. And Louisa wrote this about it. She said, a curious thing happened. A few minutes after the last breath came, as mother and I sat silently watching the shadow fall on the dear little face, uh, I saw a light mist rise from the body and float up and vanish in the air. Mother's eyes followed mine, and when I said, what did you see? She described the same light mist. The doctor said it was the life departing visibly. The next spring, the movement to abolish American slavery became a war to end uh, American slavery. And Louisa declared, I long to be a man, but as I can't fight, I will content myself with working for those who can. And she volunteered as an army nurse at a hospital in Washington, D.C. Uh, she, her service was cut short when she became sick with the typhoid fever. She returned to Concord, but then she published a book about her experience uh, called Hospital Sketches. She said it never made much money, but it allowed me my style. <clears throat> now, as John Madison re recounts in his book, Eden's Outcasts, in 1867, Thomas Niles, uh, a partner in the publishing firm of Roberts Brothers, had been intrigued by the absence of good books for girls, and it seemed to him Louisa might be the one to write one. Um, so uh, he, he asked her to do it, and she sat down. She uh, sent the first dozen chapters to Niles, and he thought they were dull. Uh, but... Uh, Almost as an afterthought, he showed the chapters to his young niece, who laughed over them until she cried. Seen by a reader whose viewpoint really mattered, the early chapters of Little Women had attractions he had failed to recognize. Uh, Louisa finished the book in two and a half months, uh, and the first printing sold out like that and was immediately went back for a reprint. It hasn't been out of print since 1868. Now, Louisa lost one negotiation with her publisher, uh, but won another one. Um, she wanted the autobiographical character of Joe to remain unmarried, as the author herself had done, but Robert's brothers insisted that readers would demand a husband for Joe. So Louisa added the character of Professor Bear. So she lost that negotiation, but the one she won was she got to keep the copyright um, to the book, which ensured financial security for herself and her family uh, for years to come. Um, with the income from Little Women, Louisa could afford to travel to Europe. And when she did, ever generous, she brought her sister May along. May was a budding artist and 
uh, wanted to pursue her studies in Europe. Um, she continued supporting May's art studies, and uh, there, there's May Alcott. She sent her to study to Europe again in 1873. Uh, May Married and settled in France, but sadly uh, died in 1879 from complications of childbirth. Uh, her daughter, Lulu, survived, and actually uh, Louisa May Alcott uh, brought Lulu to America and raised her for the first nine years of her life before she went back to Europe to live with her father. Louisa was also a suffragist uh, in 1879, uh, she, uh, when women won the right to vote in Massachusetts, uh, she was the first woman to register to vote in Concord, uh, and she encouraged other women in Concord to do the same. But as she wrote, "I'm trying to stir up the women about suffrage, but they're so timid and slow. So it's so hard to move people out of the old ruts." <clears throat> in uh, 1882, uh, Louise's father Bronson suffered a stroke. Uh, Louisa settled him in a house near her own house in Boston so she could take care of him. Um, she visited her father on March 1st, 1888, and Bronson said to Louisa, I am going up. Come with me. I wish I could, said Louisa. Bronson Alcott died three days later. And Louisa died two days after him. Her biographer Edna Cheney wrote, uh, much as Miss Al Alcott loved literature, it was not for her an end in itself, but a means. Her heart was so bound up in her family, she felt it so fully to be her sacred mission to provide for their wants that she sacrificed to it all ambitious dreams, health, leisure, everything but her integrity of soul. So these are some of the remarkable stories that in the past didn't make it into the history textbooks because women were being excluded at the time from public life and education, politics, literature, the arts. Uh, and I was very excited to discover these stories myself and it's been an honor to share them with you today. Uh, and I'm very grateful to AARP uh, and to the Concord, Massachusetts Visitor Center for putting this program together. Thank you very much. Bravo, bravo. I just wanna say if you were in a room, people might just be standing up and giving you a standing ovation. The comments have been pouring in and um, I think somebody you just said- You can stand up at home if you want. <laughs> <laughs> They'd like to have you back for another uh, lecture. So. Uh, we might have to talk about a second topic. We are going to hit on a lot of the things that you um, touched on having to do with um, uh, the Alcott sisters. Uh, later in June, we'll be doing that one. Uh, also about transcendentalism, we'll be doing that one in May. Uh, and as I said, our, on April 30th is Patriots of Color in Revolutionary New England. So at this point, you know, we've run out of time and we have a couple of questions which um, I think you've actually answered. Uh, and again, I just want you to revel in the fact that you have really um, uh, made a happy crowd here with uh, almost the same amount of people on as when we started, which is amazing. Uh, <laughs> That's good. I didn't scare anybody away. <laughs> and so um, I want to thank you so much, Victor. It's been such a pleasure getting to know you a little bit. Uh, and uh, I shared a little bit about you in the chat. Um, so let's... Uh, Let's uh, look forward to next time. Uh, please follow us uh, at aarp.org slash VCC or aarp.org slash aarp.org slash MA. And uh, have a great rest of the day um, and enjoy following history and becoming as passionate as Victor if you're not already. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Kara. I enjoyed doing this and uh, hope hopefully we can do it again. Okay, excellent. Have a good rest of the day, everybody.